Wow. <laughs> My name's Danny Trejo, and uh, I'm an addict, alcoholic. <clears throat> I, uh, I was here a long time ago, but I don't remember. But uh, everybody just kept telling me. I think, yeah, I think I even stayed at that hotel that I was at, because there was, hi, Mr. Uh, I asked him, was I here? Yeah, you were here quite a while ago. You know? <laughs> and I was sober. I, uh, you know, I had no idea, and, and this is just, and people that are just starting out on this journey of sobriety and being clean, you got no idea where you're going to end up. Let me, honest to God, it's like, it's, it's funny, you know, I, uh, I came out of prison in 1969, I had a year clean coming out, I, I, I got clean in, uh, Solidad State Prison. I was in the hole. <clears throat> Me, Ray Pacheco, Henry Quijada, we were uh, involved in a very serious prison riot. And some people got hurt really bad. And uh, uh, inside in a riot is a gas chamber offense. And Ray Pacheco socked a free person. That's a gas chamber offense. Henry Quijada ruptured the coach. That's definitely a gas chamber offense. And it was alleged that I threw a rock and hit Lieutenant Givens in the head. That's definitely a gas chamber offense. So, uh, 1969, it's 1968, Cinco de Mayo. Cinco de Mayo, everybody thinks Cinco de Mayo means 5th of May. But if you're like a real Mexican, I mean from the heart, you know. Cinco de Mayo means get bail money. <laughs> yeah. Ninety-nine percent of the Mexicans do not even know what Cinco de Mayo is celebrating. You know what I mean? Just like, let's get drunk. It's just a get drunk day. That's tequila was invented for Cinco de Mayo. Okay, because you can go to jail and not even know why, and uh, and you can. Uh, you can get out of jail, and you're still asking. You can ask the judge, well, you know, what am I here for? You know, it's a blank. And so Cinco de Mayo, 1968, that was when that riot started. And <clears throat> if you can picture, there's about 3,000 men in this prison in Soledad, and there's uh, probably 2,000 of them are Mexicans, and probably 1,999 are drunk or loaded. There's one guy that's just not going to know I'm, I'm in AA or something. I don't know. But everybody's wasted. And uh, this riot started. Ray socked this free person, and it just exploded. It was just an explosion. It's really it's not funny, but it's, yeah, it is. It's like... Somebody socks somebody, and then it's just <laughs> everything. People start throwing rocks and burning things, and and uh, I was a good burner. I used to like light fires, and uh, <laughs> nine times out of ten, I would light a fire, then realize I was locked in my cell. It's not, <laughs> it's not a good idea, you know. No, and but this one day we're on a baseball field, and this riot takes off, and I'm go to the hole and. Ray's screaming. Ray had come down from Tascadero, which is a state mental hospital. That's run by the Department of Health. That's, that's the nut house, but for the state. And uh, Vacaville, that's run by the Department of Corrections. That's where I was. And, uh, and uh, still a nut house. But we, uh, I'm hearing Ray yell, hey, they might gas us. And, and, uh, I'm thinking, they might, you know, and, and uh, I'm kind of just sitting here in this hole. <clears throat> and you have to remember, there's no worse feeling in the world than a body full of drugs and alcohol and a mind full of alcoholics or narcotics anonymous. It is the absolute worst feeling in the world. It'll make you cry, 
Okay, Italy, he just busted. in. What? I, I know better. You know, I mean, it's easy does it. It's he, all these, all these things. He, come on, let go, let God, you know. And, but you're locked up in prison. And, uh, and the first time I ever heard about Alcoholics Anonymous was in 1959, right? And, uh, and me and about 20 friends, a whole carload, were cruising down Van Nuys Boulevard <laughs> in, in my neighborhood. And right on the corner of Lev Street and Van Nuys Boulevard, there was this huge craftsman's house. And there's about 30 cars parked in front of this house. Now, the neighborhood that I grew up in, Pacoima, two cars in front of a house means they got guests. You know, it wasn't like a two-car neighborhood. And, uh, well, there was always like one car, a Chevy on blocks in the front, you know. But, but so here we, hey, there's, there's something going on. This, this the murder capital of Los Angeles was Pacoima. And they're not inviting the murderers. What the hell's wrong with them? And, and it's like it was like this 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 revelation. Wait a minute, they can't do this. And we stopped the car, went to the trunk of the car to get the tools necessary to crash events. We got tire irons, uh, hammers, pieces of pipe. Uh, I had a case of beer, three bottles of wine, half pint of whiskey. I was already loaded on second Red Devils. Uh, pills, and I had a 38 snub nose, and we um, proceeded to crash this event. You know, kicked in the. You have to. You can't like walk up to an event, and, like knock on the door, you know, <laughs> lock the door and call the cops. You know, so we kicked in the door and everybody rushed in, and the first thing we saw was a big sign that said, "We care." The kid. And we're trying to, there's only two greetings you can get when you crash an event. Either everybody rushes to the opposite side of the room, that means they're willing to throw this event in your honor. <laughs> or they rush to the side of the room you're on, usually the athlete parties, they usually rush to the side of the room you're on, that means they're not, you know, them tire irons and pieces of pipe and all that stuff. We got the stupidest greeting in the world. We had all these old people. I hate saying old people because they were like 40. You know, <laughs> <clears throat> they come rushing at us. Hi, I'm Bob. <laughs> hey. And it's hard shaking hands, holding a case of beer, three bottles of wine, half pint of whiskey, and loaded on pills, you know. And I always told my troops, stay in a group. Look, we stay in a group. We got them. They can't hurt us. We got the weapons. We got... But what you guys did, you did that divide and conquer. When I look around, you had them all in like little groups of four. <laughs> <laughs> Counseling or talking to them. Yeah, we don't drink. And I'm trying to get out of here, right? And this guy stops me, introduces himself, and, and says, uh, Danny, I've been on the program eight years. Now, I don't know what the program in juvenile hall is like four months, you know what I mean? I don't what you're talking about, a program you can't get out of this house. And, uh, <laughs> and he says, I've been sober eight years. Stupid thing to say to a guy holding a case of beer, three bottles of wine. Get away from me. You know? I don't want to share nothing with you. You just drink all night. You know? He said, I haven't wanted to drink. And now, when he said that, I can never remember, even at 15 years of age, not wanting to drink. My uncle turned me on to grass when I was eight years old, gave me a fix when I was 12. I started drinking right after that. And uh, that's one of the reasons I had a tough time like identifying in AA, because Everybody always talked about everything they lost. I drank for 50 years. God, you're 15 years old. Got a long way to go. <laughs> and they tell about it. I had a car, a boat, a cabin in Mammoth. 
And I was drinking scotch. <laughs> scotch, I went to bourbon. I think there's a step down. I don't know. I have no idea. I, <laughs> I lost some material wealth. Started drinking wine. <laughs> Somebody else, can you top this? I drank for 55 years. Now, wait a minute. You guys are killing me here. I'm 16 years old. I got, what, 30 years left? Yeah. And inevitably, he said, here he comes. I had a car, a boat, a cabin in Mammoth. Drinking scotch. Scotch, I went to bourbon. From bourbon, I went to beer. I ended up losing all my material wealth, drinking wine in the morning in an alley. And every go, oh, my God. Here, I started drinking wine in the morning in an alley. <laughs> so I started drinking. I shot heroin with my uncle, and I said, wait a minute, you tough shooting heroin when you're 13 years old. And I, we started stealing wine out of Dale's Market. And wine does the trick, if you can keep it down. You know, if you, I got thrown out of a coin with junior high about eight times, and not for... Be always, but they had, I had cornflakes on my shoes all the time from just, well. <laughs> and wine does the trick. Let me tell you something. When you're 13, 14, 15 years old, wine does the trick, especially, there's a trick to wine, because you know, wine, you get in a fight with wine and somebody kicks you in the eye, you, boom, ooh, that hurt. Put pills with that. And it's like somebody kicks you in the eye, bang, you see stars. Oh, but you get enough pills, it's like changes the whole attitude. Wow, did you see me block that kick with my eye? You know? <laughs> so this guy says, Danny, look, why don't you put that stuff outside and join us? And I said, shut up, old man. I got penitentiaries to go to, boop. And uh, because everybody in my neighborhood, understand, knew that we were going to the pit. You go to juvenile hall, you go to youth authority, you go to camp, and you go to the pen. Everybody I knew, that's what they did. That was the road to recovery, I guess. I don't know. And uh, the success. And, and this, uh, this guy whispers the curse of Alcoholics Anonymous. He says, Danny, if you leave this program, you're going to die, go insane, or go to jail. Notice how quiet the room got right there, see? That was the voodoo of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> you're screwed. I just cursed all of you. It's that simple. Do you understand? It's like from now on, you might forget everybody in this room, everybody in your recovery, you will not forget this Mexican. You won't. When you see those lights in a cop car behind you, bang, 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 and you know you're drunk, or you know you're loaded, or you know you're like something spilt in the car, watch the lights. The lights go, die, go insane, go to jail. Die, go insane, go to jail. Die, go insane, go to jail. They do. They do, I swear to God. It's like, watch them die, go insane. God, man. So I'm going back and forth to prison. I, you know, I it just did everything. My uncle showed me how to do robberies. That's what we did. And it was like this crazy drug. But you have to understand, like weed, you start smoking weed, you're eight, nine, ten years. It's not really bad. And then you, you heroin, and that's just, the, that was the neighborhood, period. And... Uh, Knowing about Alcoholics Anonymous, I learned about Alcoholics Anonymous in prison. I met my sponsor in 1962 in prison. I was inside, he was outside. And uh, he was a, a speaker, and a guy named Johnny Harris. And, uh, and I'll never forget, he said, he looked at me, man, he goes, God damn, you know what, the only thing that's gonna beat you to San Quentin is the headlights on the bus. 
I thought that was a compliment. I just, yeah, yeah, you got that right, homie. And, and I see this guy like four times in different penitentiaries. He's outside, I'm inside. You know? So I learned about Alcoholics Anonymous. Nar I started a Narcotics Anonymous meeting in Soledad State Prison. And uh, since Soledad, like I said, in 1968, I'm sitting in that hole. And I'm thinking, I'm through. I'm done. And again, with, with the knowledge of, of the program, the 12 steps, the whole, all of it right here, and knowing I'm through. I'm in the hole. I'm butt naked. I'm standing there. It's cold. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I'm remembering every teacher that I ever had wrote uh, amazing potential. I had amazing potential. Remember that? All through school. I, had a, I failed, but I had amazing potential. <laughs> Failing, but has amazing potential. Every probation officer I ever had, unbelievable potential. But I'm violating this inmate. You know, I'm going back to jail. You know? Parole officer, same thing. Amazing. I had a lot of potential. Now, when you have a lot of potential, and you're in the hole in Soledad, and you might go to the gas chamber, your potential don't mean that much. <laughs> and it's like you wonder what happened, you know? You wonder what, if you didn't know about the program of AA, and if you didn't know about the program of NA, you'd be okay. Because, well, this is what happens when when you do what I do. But if you know about these programs, you got this thing that doesn't have, didn't have to happen. You didn't listen. Remember? Yeah, I mean, and it's like you've got this, this program back here telling you about, hey, it doesn't have to be this way. And so I'm thinking I'm going to the gas chamber. I kind of, I kind of, had a reputation in the penitentiary as lightweight and welterweight champion. I knew people and people knew me and we had a lot of drugs and, and uh, I had seen this movie when I was a kid and it was about, uh, some of you have never, but East Side Kids and one of the guys, the main guy in the neighborhood, the guy with the good reputation, the tough guy, they were sending him to the chair. And I'll never forget Muggs and Glimpy and all these guys that were in the gang were saying, ah, he'll spit in their eyes. Yeah, he'll scream, come and get me, copper. <laughs> and then Pat O'Brien had to come and tell him, no, he, he went out like a little bitch. You know, he was <laughs> screaming and yelling, pissed his pants. You know. And I remember... <clears throat> I remember asking God, just, just let me die with dignity. That's all. Just let me die with dignity. And, and, and I'll say your name every day, and I will do whatever I can for my fellow man. Now, that's what people have been telling me to do in Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous since 1959. Do you understand? Just do whatever you can for your fellow man. Be of service. They call that be of service, you know. And... Uh, And by the grace of God, we had a DJ reject, which means that they sent the they sent they sent the charges to the district attorney, and he rejected it because the, the 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 witnesses he had said, "Your mother did it. Uh, I saw your dad. You know, <laughs> Jesus told me to do it." Uh, so the DJ reject, top them out. Top mount means just do your top. I had a 10 top. Ray had a, a seven top because he had come down from Tascadero, which is mental health. It was only seven years. And uh, so Henry got out. Both those guys died in robberies. I got out uh, 1969. And uh, August 23rd, 1969, that's when I got out of the joint. And uh, I've been clean and sober ever since. I've been... Uh, 
un <laughs> I, 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 let, me, let me tell you, you're not clapping for me, you're clapping for what God's done with me. Because I, I didn't have a thing to do with it. There's, there's <laughs> anybody, anybody with 60 days clean it probably works a better program than I do. Okay, I suck, you know. I, 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 I've got 51 years clean and sober, okay? 51 years, and I'm still doing the same thing I did in 1968. The same, I haven't changed, same thing. It's like, you would think that, come on, 51 years, I can, Hanya, Hanya, Nelevalahara, you would think. <laughs> I don't know where I got that. That was funny. <laughs> but, no, 50, you would think, come on, you know some shit now. You know, nothing. No, honest to God. I, I still do what my sponsor tells me. And uh, uh, Johnny Harris, God, he's a beautiful dude, man. Uh, it's, he's, he's, it's funny. Hey, Johnny, sorry I didn't call you. You know, I'm in, I was in the Ukraine the last time I called him. And, uh, and he says, hey, it's 2 o'clock in the damn morning. I said, well, it's 9 o'clock here. <laughs> and uh, and I, I was in Ukraine when Trump, and uh, they did that phone call and stuff. And so it, my, every, everybody panicked. I'm wondering, was he, I like Ukraine. Everybody, they had one to get me out of there. And I, uh, why? And I don't even know what's going on. And all of a sudden, uh, you want me to go? Yeah, go. Yeah. Did the check clear? Yeah, the check. Okay, let's go. Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and so, you know, like, like everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. Everything. I come out of the pen in 19, 1969. I had, I had no social skills whatsoever. If you were on fire, I wouldn't piss. I don't care if, unless you owe me money. I, I, no, really, I didn't. I wasn't like a sharing, caring person. It's like you, know, you go for what you know, and uh, and uh, uh, I come out of the pen and I, I make this promise, right? You know, because I thought it was just going to be a couple of years, and they were going to kill me, and it, it wasn't. God fooled me and gave me the rest of my life. He's okay now. Hold up, you do this. So now I got to say his name every day. I say it eight, nine, ten, twelve, thirty times a day. See, I, <laughs> I don't want to. I don't want to get pissed off, and. Uh, and, no, and, and, and every morning, you know what, dear Heavenly Father, let me help every, anybody I come into contact with. That's my prayer. And it's all about being of service. This whole thing, I have seen people, God, I have seen people pray. Dear God, they got, they got shrines in their houses and they dan yard. They do. It just, that doesn't matter if you're, not, if you're not being of service. I've seen people work the steps crazy. I mean, crazy. And you can't work the steps and not be of service. You can't work the st steps and, 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 not, and, not, and not be a uh, uh, spirit. You can't. It's impossible. But people say, what do you do? I'm working the steps. Leave me alone. No, you're not. No, no, no. You know, if you're mad, you're not. Because we, a lot of us, we've lost that mad thing. We've lost the right thing. Some of us, I grew up, I had no mad in me. I had... Here and rage. That's it. You know, no way. What happened to get mad? Oh, I don't want to kill everybody. You know, because most people, I, I, I was a court liaison for a narcotics prevention project. And the worst thing in the world is go to court and don't have no mad. Because you watch attorneys, well, I, uh, holy, I object. No, I wait, hold on. And you, oh, you're going to sock him now? You're going to sock him? You're going to sock Because you're waiting for him to get socked. But people actually argue. And, and for me, the bottom line to an argument was a murder. So I don't, I don't argue. I still don't argue. You know, people want to argue with me. I turn around. <laughs> You're not worth killing. You know? So, but so so it's like I, I I get to this place in, in my life now that that's all I want to do. Everybody I know, everybody I know, everybody that I call friend, everybody that breaks bread with me has socks and thermal underwear in their trunk of their car. Because if you pass a homeless person and you just hand them socks and, uh, and some thermals here. 
Wait, what? Who you with? Who you? No, 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 here. You take the socks. Shut up. And <laughs> and because and, and, that's what we do. And some people have the nerve to. Why do you do that? Because they need socks. <laughs> that's all. No, for no other reason. And the other reason is makes me feel good. You know, I'm like a feel good guy. I was a feel-good guy. I can't say I was a feel-good guy when I shot heroin because I really still don't know how I felt. You know, people say, how do you feel when you shoot heroin? <laughs> I don't know. Don't ask me. <laughs> but, but here's this thing. <laughs> God, I'm going to be a funny day. But... <laughs> But you don't feel, you just come out of it, you know what I mean? And it's the same thing growing up. I, you, I wanted to party, I wanted to party. And I ended up all the time in a big overstuffed chair. And if you ask me, what are you doing? Party. I'm drool, drool. So we get here, however we get here, and we bring our bag with us, this bag of junk, this bag of secrets. And we're only as sick as our secrets. And I did not know how to do an inventory when I got here. And I went to him. I remember asking Frank Russo, Frank Russo, Frank Russo. I say that because he told me never to mention his name. And, uh, <laughs> and my, spawn, my first sponsor coming out of the pen, right? And, uh, and, uh, and I said, uh, uh, Frank, how do you work an inventory? I'll never forget. He says, it's in the book. So he asked me about a week later, how you coming with that inventory? I don't know, no, Mrs. Jones. Then uh, <laughs> let's go to a meeting. I went to a meeting in 1969. This is, this is before they had the road map to the steps and all that. You know, this is go for what you know. And, uh, and I'm in the meeting, and this guy just says, you're only as sick as your secrets. Whoa. That, wow, you know what I mean? Boy, am I screwed. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and I started, like, I wrote down these secrets. Just, I wrote down about, just only about 10 of them. You know, I still got about 15, 20 more. But I, and I remember I had them in my pocket for like three weeks. And Frankie, what's wrong? I want to show you my, my inventory, my secrets. And, okay, so 3 o'clock in the morning after the late, late meeting, because that's all we did, go to meetings. Go to the eight o'clock meeting and then the because meetings used to be at 8 30. Went to 8 30 meeting and then the the late meeting, then the late, late meeting, then the early meeting, you know, you know and the morning meetings. So we just go to meetings. And so out in front of a place called uh, behind the Allen Nest in the alley, we lit a fire in a trash can and we're standing there. And I give him this this inventory of 10 secrets written on a gas bill. It wasn't even my gas bill. Now people come with like pages mimeographed and typed and computer and wow, you did all that? Yeah, and, and mine was, I had it on a gas bill. It wasn't even my gas bill. And, uh, and I gave it to Frank and he was reading it. He goes, wow, you did that then? Yeah. Did you like it? Yeah. I guess so, you did it again. You know? and, <laughs> and, and so then I'll never forget, he tore it up and threw it in this fire, in the smoke. And then he's going like this. And I'm thinking, wow, that must be some, like some really spiritual ninja shit right there. You know? <laughs> what are you doing? He's like, I'm, I'm giving all this to your higher power in the smoke. I thought, whoa, that is ninja right there. <laughs> and he says, now, every time you think about one of these things, you got to remember you've given it to God in the smoke. It's God's. And I thought, that's so heavy. You know? <laughs> Ten years later, Frank tells me, do you know what, Danny? I got an amends to make. What is it? I didn't know what I was doing. I just made that up. <laughs> I said, well, don't tell none of my sponsees because they all think that God's got that shit in the smoke. <laughs> it worked. Yeah. So it doesn't matter how you do that. Man, I've seen people try to work perfect. There's no such thing with the perfection. We don't deal with perfection. We just, we, all we want to do is just get next to God. 
And this friend of mine having trouble with a higher, higher power. What's a higher power? Sounds like a Japanese motorcycle, seven, 750 higher power. You know? <laughs> and I said, you know what? Look, just stop a wave. That's what Sam, a guy named Sam Hardy told me. Stop a wave. Just go to the beach and stop a wave. Just go there and stop a wave. That'll be a higher power. Stop a wave. I can't stop a wave. Can't stop a wave. You know? I tried. Can't do it. And, uh, so it, 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 people think this higher power has, has something to do with, with God. has something to do. It's just admitting that I'm powerless. Do you understand? That's all it is. Admitting I'm powerless. Wait a minute. I am powerless. Take this. Who are you giving it to? I don't care. It doesn't matter. I can't deal with it. I remember when I, my son was like five and six. He had better understanding of life than I. Dad, you need a meeting. Shut up! <laughs> what the hell's wrong? You can't tell me I need a meeting. <laughs> I love this program. Do you understand? This program, my son Gilbert, he had a bout with, with heroin, with drugs. And I'll never forget what he told me. He says, Dad, I smoked weed when I was like nine. And you had taken me to so many meetings that the minute I smoked weed, I felt like I slipped. <laughs> <laughs> but when he was done, he knew where to go. My daughter, I almost lost her to this disease. Dude, I almost lost her, man. It's like she was, uh, her and her cousin were asleep. And she got up in the middle of the night and went fixed went back to bed, boom, went out. And my little dog, Sergeant Pepper, started screaming and barking and biting uh, uh, Corina to wake up. And Corina woke up and looked at my daughter. My daughter was blue. Drug her into the bathroom, put her in a shower, gave her uh, CPR and brought her back. And I was in Germany, so. They called my secretary and told her, Mary Matickle, she had another one, another lady on the program, right? That's all I got. That's all I got. People on a program around me, you know? And uh, my daughter called up and told Mary, I need some money. No, you don't. You're going to rehab. And uh, I come home from Germany. My daughter's in rehab. And uh, parents sometimes are pretty stupid. I gotta say that now that I'm a parent. Cause my daughter is so funny. She went out on a pass and I just got off a plane. Uh, she'd been in this rehab. I just got off a plane and she called me, Daddy, are you here? Yeah, come pick us up. We're, we split up on pass and blah, 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 blah. So I had to like take her back to this rehab and, uh, and say, yeah, they were with me. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, sure they were. They were with me. And uh, no, hell no, they didn't split up. And so then, you know, so then her counselor the next day calls me and says, God, Mr. Trejo, we've had such a breakthrough. Oh, my God. It's beautiful. That's what happened. Danielle confessed that she wasn't with you. She actually confessed that she went out uh, on, a, on a date and, and she's back. They didn't get loaded. We tested them. Damn. And I told her never to plead guilty. Mr. Trejo, you're restricted from this rehab from now on. <laughs> My daughter's going on seven years clean. <laughs> My son's going on six. And uh, my big boy, he never had a problem. You know, he's a gamer. All he does is run around and win money. <laughs> and uh, I... Uh, I said everything good that's ever happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. I got into the movie business on a 12-step call. I went to just work with this kid. And it happened to be on the movie set of a movie called Runaway Train, John Voight and Eric Roberts. I walked onto this movie set I thought it was the cutest thing I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> All these guys were walking around acting like convicts. It was like... You know, hey, get out of the way, mother. Just really growling. And, you know, prison is probably the most polite place you'll ever be. Because yeah. if I'm a murderer and you're a murderer, 
I don't want to offend you. You know, it's like that simple, and you don't want to offend me. So, but but they have this this thing of everybody running around pushing people. It doesn't work that way, you know. And and so this guy says, "Hey, do you want to be in this movie?" And I said, "What do I got to do?" He said, "Do you want to be an extra?" I said, "Extra what?" <laughs> he says, "Can you act like a convict?" So I'll give it a shot. <laughs> give me a blue shirt. I take off my shirt. I got that big tattoo. The tattoo I got on my chest, it, it doesn't say I love America. It doesn't say mom. It says, oh, this guy was in prison. Yes. <laughs> prison tattoo, needle and thread. And so, so he said, leave your shirt off. So I'm standing there with no shirt, like just taking this all in. I, I kept smearing everybody. I, these guys had tattoos. I go, Oh, hey, you're smeared. You know, all had these fake tattoos. Everybody had a teardrop. It was like funny. You know? and, uh, and this guy, I'm looking at this guy. He looks familiar. He comes over and says, hey, you're Danny Trejo. I go, yes. I saw you win the lightweight and the welterweight title up in San Quentin. I go, you're Eddie Bunker. I knew this guy. This guy was in prison with me, and he was a writer. And he became real famous in prison because he knew how to write writs. And a writ has to be grammatically correct and in the language of the court. Or they could just kick it out. They don't even have to read it. It's misspelled word, they kick it out. You know? And uh, and he, uh, he said, what are you doing here, Danny? I said, uh, hanging out with this kid. They're going to give me 50 bucks for acting like a convict. And that was funny because we'd been doing this for free forever, right? You know I mean? like, and he says, are you still boxing? I go, yeah, I'm 40 years old, homie. I train, but I don't want to get hit in the face anymore. He says, we need somebody to train one of the actors how to box. I said, what's it pay? He says, 320 a day. Are they going to give me 50 bucks for acting like I said, how bad you want this guy beat up, homie? You know, I... I I thought he wanted me to beat somebody up. I said, okay, I'll write about it. I'll, I'll tell John, hey, I did it for 320 bucks. He'd understand. You know. <laughs> and, uh, and then they were going to give me 320 a day. I said, when I get to beat this guy up every day? I, <laughs> and uh, he said, no, you got to be careful because this actor is really high strung. He might sock you. I said, for 320 bucks, give him a stick, homie. Are you crazy? <laughs> I've been beat up for free. I started training an actor named Eric Roberts, how to box for the movie called Runaway Train. And Eric respected me, and he would do whatever I told him to do. And the, the director who, who, who didn't understand movie stars, movie stars are very high strung. They suck. And... Uh, and, and, and he had had a lot of trouble with this one actor, so he, he saw that Eric would do whatever I told him, so he, I'll never, he comes over to me and he goes, real soft-spoken, a guy named Andrei Kajalowski, Russian aristocrat. His grandfather wrote a national anthem for Russians. I don't know. He goes, Danny, you be in movie, and you fight Eric in movie. And you be my friend. If you come from a prison background, you get worried when people say, you be my friend. <laughs> when people say that, you're trying to understand, OK, are we talking Miss or Mr. here? What is <laughs> Very few buddies in the pen. And, and then he leans over and he kisses me on one cheek, kisses me on the other cheek, and walks away. I look at Eddie. I go, Eddie, I'm going to train the kid for 320 a day, but if I'm going to be kissing that old man, I want more money. <laughs> no, Dan, he's European. I don't know what the hell that man, you know what I mean? But they kiss. You know? That was the start of my career. From that day to right now, I've done over 380 movies. 
Everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. And if you want a better life, get into service. If you want a better life, help everyone you can. If you want to be, I'm successful only by helping. That's, I got into the, re, the, the, I got into the, to the restaurant business. I, I, I took a low budget movie that I really didn't want to do, but they needed a, a, they needed a lead. They needed somebody that could get them the money. So I did this movie called Badass. And I said, okay, I'll do it. You know what I mean? And then they got their money. And, and the, the producer saw that I like good food. And he asked me, Danny, why don't you open a restaurant? Jokingly, I said, Trejo's Tacos. <laughs> Two movies later, this guy brings me a business plan, a book. He's, Here, Dan, would you want to read Me being the brilliant businessman that I am, I gave it to my secretary. <laughs> Check that out, would you? Tell me how much they want. And my agent, my secretary came back and said, hey, this is not a bad plan. You know? They're not asking for anything up front. Are you kidding? No. Uh-uh. Let's try it. So I made the decision. <laughs> My agent already told him, yeah, it's a go. <laughs> so we've got Trejo's Tacos. We've got six Trejo's Cantina. We've got a Trejo's Coffee and Donuts. And again, I did somebody a favor. It's everything good that has happened has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. I got a restaurant in LAX, like by the Puck guy, that Puck whatever his name is, man. He's got, like, he's really famous, right? And, uh, she, uh, hey, Puck, what's up, homie? You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, it really, and it's like this stuff. I started a record company trying to help somebody. Bang, we dropped the record, an album. And then I got this little fighter. Her name is, uh, they needed some help training. Her name is Sanisa Estrada. She just won the WBA championship of the world. It's 108 pounds. And, uh, and uh, I said, you don't weigh as much as the boxing glove, man. But, but she, you know, it's her story's like so beautiful. I, I love stories. She says, her dad comes out of the pen, right? He's a boxer. He's training the boys. She's eight years old. And they're, uh, Daddy, I want to box. No, 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 no. You know, you can't box. It's for boys. No, no, no. It's for boys. So she whines so much. Her dad gets this kid around 12 years old and says, look, I don't want you to hurt her, but I want you to convince her she doesn't want to box. Right? So they put her in with this 12-year-old. She beats the shit out of him. I mean, she, she didn't know how to box, but she had him on the ground trying to kick <laughs> Wait, wait. So she, just, she was on that Canelo undercard. She just won the WBC champ of the world. It's just like everything, everything good that has happened to me has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. And it seems to help everyone around me. And I'm not the catalyst. The catalyst is doing good. The catalyst is helping your neighbor. I got, I got to tell you one, I got, I had two, they both passed away now, but I had two convicts, right? And they were living with me. And, uh, and uh, there's always like four or five convicts around my house, right? And, uh, and uh, this one, my neighbor comes over and knocks on the door, and Angel's there. Angel's doing it, right? He just did 32 years. And he, yeah, what you need? And, uh, and uh, she says, you know, I'm here. And she hands him her keys and says, I'm leaving uh, for, for a week. Would you, would you please tell Dan, watch my cat and, 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 and you know, feed the cat and watch the house and leave. Angel walks into the living room and goes, hey, does that lady know that everybody in this house has been busted for burglary? <laughs> <clears throat> for burglary <laughs> and Angel and Joey honest to God the cat got fat <laughs> every night they would actually parole the perimeter <laughs> they would go check everywhere it was like funny <laughs> I got a video of them checking the window checking <laughs> I said, hey it's a good neighborhood Holmes yeah <laughs> 
So everything good that has happened has happened as a direct result of helping someone else. I don't know how many times I can say that. I don't know how many times I can say, I am so blessed. I am so blessed just to be alive. We all wait for that miracle. Miracle, what miracle? The miracle is if you're clean and sober and you, you wake up clean and sober, you're already in the miracle. I'm in the miracle. All I have to do is live the miracle. I live the miracle every day. God bless you. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>